Thanks. Zoom expert. There we go. All right, welcome everyone uh, to teaching statistics across any setting. Uh, Bob well, is going is, to uh, lead us in here with introducing our speaker for tonight. <laughs> yeah, so this is our 13th meeting, but uh, sometimes it seems like just our first and we, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today we have Jeff Dodds, who's a senior creator at Khan Academy in Mountain View, California. Um, before joining Khan Academy, he taught for 10 years in Kalamazoo Central High School in the great state of Michigan. Um, he has seven years experience teaching AP statistics and his favorite unit is sampling distributions. And when he's not planning courses and writing content, he enjoys playing soccer, running, cooking with his wife and playing fetch with his cat. So welcome Jeff and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thanks Bob and thanks for the invite Bob and Liam, really, uh, really happy to be here. Um, before I get started, um, I wanna respect everyone's time. Um, if you feel like, I left a lot of time at the end for questions, um, but if something comes up while I'm speaking, feel free to jump in with a question so we don't miss it and forget it later. Um, don't have this super tightly scripted, so I'm happy to do interruptions. Um, like Bob said, I'm Jeff. Um, I work at Khan Academy and um, I work on AP statistics at Khan Academy. I sort of like own that course, but I also work on a lot of other math content as well. Um, and I pretty much just wanted to give you a spin through what we have to offer. Um, but before I jumped in too deeply, I wanted to do a like an extremely scientific and accurate poll of how familiar or unfamiliar people are with Khan Academy. So um, if your camera's off, um, you could just type it in the chat or if your camera's on, you could just like hold up a finger, but like just on a scale of one to five, like if you have little to no familiarity at all with Khan Academy, can you hold up like a one or put it in the chat? And if you're like extremely expert, like I use Khan Academy all the time with my classes, can you hold up a five? And it could be in the chat or this, just so I can kind of get a sense. Okay, I'm seeing twos and threes. I'm making a dot plot in my head right now. Twos and threes. Okay, got it. Two and a half. Can't do dot plot. I could do a dot plot. Okay, um, great. That's extremely useful. So I'm gonna screen share and get a slide deck going. Um, you could write that down, or I think we could share it out after Lee and Bob, but um, my, my email address is there. If anything comes up um, after this presentation, feel free to reach out. Um, my email inbox is open, and there's my address. Um, but today I wanted to give you a quick tour of um, what we have to offer in terms of AP statistics content um, at Khan Academy. Um, the subtitle there, the free resources and tools for teachers and students, I like to remind people, um, sometimes I take it for granted and forget, so I like have to remind myself to mention it, that like everything I'm showing you is free. Um, there's no premium tier where I'm trying to like hook you in with the free stuff and then get you to pay for something after. Um, everything you see is free and it's going to stay that way. Um, we're very lucky to be supported by large and small donors alike. So um, Fear not, I'm not trying to sell you anything, just trying to show you um, what I work on and what I'm proud of. So um, just the general structure of what I'll be showing you today. I wanna show you the course structure and content so you can get a good sense of how the content is laid out in the course um, and what we have to offer. Um, then after that, I'll show you the mastery and learning mechanics that we use on the site. Um, these mastery mechanics, um, I'll show you more, but they're essentially like if a student is working independently on our platform, um, what sort of guides them through uh, our content. Um, then I'll show you teacher tools where if you want to put some guardrails up and assign things to students and see how they're doing on our content, then you can use our teacher tools and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. And again, if questions pop up during my presentation, please feel free to speak up or put it in the chat. So let's dive in and look at uh, what we have in our AP Stats course. Um, if you go to khanacademy.org um, and click the courses menu, then you'll see uh, all the courses we have to offer and AP and AP slash college statistics tucked in the math menu. Um, just in, just generally speaking, like big broad overview, um, AP stats course, we have over 140 practice exercises with, uh, 
combined like roughly over 1600 items. Um, and those all have supporting videos and articles. And our course is aligned in scope to the CED. Um, so we made this course before the CED came out. And when the CED came out, we made some new content to fill gaps for new, new topics like mosaic plots and two sample differences of sampling distributions. Um, and coming this summer, um, the new change you'll see this summer is that we're going to shuffle around the course and unit structure. Um, so the sequence is refreshed. Um, so that way the course, it's currently aligned in scope, but after the summer, it'll be scope and sequence aligned. Um, this summer, we're also adding, we have these new um, courses that we're calling get ready courses. Um, we made these in response to distance learning and COVID by sort of popular demand from the teachers who really heavily use our, our platform already. Um, so these courses like get ready for third grade, get ready for fourth grade are designed to have the sort of key prerequisite um, pieces of content um, to get ready for that on grade level course. Um, and these have been really successful teachers and students and parents have really liked them. Um, so we're going to build two more of these. We're going to build one for AP statistics and one for AP calculus as well. Um, and um, that's sort of my next project I'm starting in a few weeks. I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm trying to like have the mindset of like, if I was still teaching AP statistics, um, like would I want to give this as a summer assignment? That's sort of how I'm thinking about it. Um, and we're also adding even more practice to the course as well. So I'll move on here. So when you navigate to the, um, to the AP statistics course or any course on Khan Academy's website, you see this page that we call the course page. And what this shows is sort of just an, an overview of what units we have in the course and what lessons fall within each unit. Um, so you can't see any of the actual content we have yet before you drill down and click into a unit or a lesson. Um, but each lesson, once you get there, contains videos, practice exercises, and sometimes articles. Um, so this is a good place to get started browsing and trying out content from a student's perspective. Um, I honestly, before I started working for Khan Academy, had a um, sort of misconception that Khan Academy was mostly videos. Um, and now that I now that I work for Khan Academy and I write the stuff that isn't the videos, um, it's, it's, it's interesting, we have far more than videos and we work really hard on the not videos. And um, yeah, I think, you'll be, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you've never looked at Khan Academy or haven't looked in a while. Um, this, the balance between video content and practice content is, is pretty strong. So once you click into a unit page, then you can see um, you can see what's in that unit in terms of lessons and then what content is in each lesson. So this is just an example where I clicked into the study design unit and I see that it has this first, it has this unit about sampling and observational studies. Um, and when you look off to the right here, you see that there are under this learn menu, there are videos and articles. And the icons there distinguish the videos between the articles with the play button and the little piece of paper with the folded corner. And then the practice column here shows you what exercises we have for that lesson. So this lesson has, let's see, five videos, an article, and four exercises. Um, also, you see here that when you interact with one of these exercises, um, this first exercise here is going to give you four questions. And this next exercise, generalizability of results, is going to give you seven questions. And bias in samples and surveys is seven questions, and so on and so forth. Um, I thought this would be a good time to stop and take care of any questions and even show some live site navigation if you had any questions on, on those pages. There are no questions in the chat, but um, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask them. You, you can even unmute yourself to ask a question. <clears throat> you might have a very tired and shy group here tonight. I'm also really good at wait time, so I'm happy to move on or sit in silence. So, okay, I will move on. And I'll start presenting again. So some of, the work, some of the work that I'm most proud of on our site, um, and I'm biased because I, I do it, is um, 
writing not only the exercises, but all of the supports that go in the exercises. Um, I think this is where, if you were interested in giving your students more practice with regular feedback, and uh, I'll admit I waited until AP review to give my students more like online work that gave them instant feedback, whether they were right or wrong. Um, but in retrospect, um, I, I work on making this content so that if I was still teaching, like I would transition to like assigning this as my homework instead. Um, because each of our exercises, um, when a student answers it, um, there are different supports built in. So for example, in this exercise, that's multiple choice on study design. Um, there are multiple choice answer rationales that explain the, uh, the common misconceptions that lead to certain wrong answers or drive home the key. Like if a student just guesses and gets an answer right, like, eh, I think it's C and they answer it correctly, then the rationale will come out explaining like, yep, this is correct, here's why, and really drive home the, the key understanding of why that was correct. Um, so we have these multiple choice rationales, that's one form of support. And another form of support we have is that um, if a student is stuck on a question, um, they can click a little link that says stuck get help and this related content surfaces. So these are videos that don't necessarily show how to solve the exact question that they're working on, but show how to, but show either a concept or a skill that will, that is directly related to the problem they're working on. Um, we also offer um, this get a hint. These are step-by-step -step work solutions. Um, we're talking about potentially rethinking calling them hints because they, um, the first hint in the sequence is like a hint of how to think about the question, but then the rest of them are step-by-step -step instructions that show how to solve it. Um, and I was gonna take, jump out of the slide deck and show you some of these on the live site. Um, students and teachers use these a lot of different ways. Um, you see in text right here, it says, if, however, if you use a hint, this problem won't count towards your progress. So you don't have to worry that students are, oh, they're only getting all the right answers because they use the hints. When they use hints, they don't get credit for getting the question correctly. Um, a lot of students don't like that. Um, and a lot of teachers don't like that too. But, um, but the whole idea of hints, some students use them as notes. Um, in classroom visits, I've seen students using Khan Academy where they'll, they'll work through an exercise and they'll just not even try to get anything right on the first go because they haven't learned it yet. And they say like, you know, I don't like watching the videos. I'd rather just do some problems, click all the hints and write them down as notes. And I thought that was fascinating and made me feel good because we spend a lot of time writing them and uh, students get value from them. So I want to show you some of these in action on the site. Um, let's see. So, so this is what happens when a student answers a question. Um, I want to answer this one incorrectly. I wrote this item about my cat. Um, Okay, let's see. What makes Ricardo's conclusion inappropriate? Well, he concluded about his cat. So it's not a problem that he only used his cat. Okay, so notice when I answer that one incorrectly, I get uh, an answer rationale that says Ricardo's conclusion was only about his cat. So it's okay then. Um, let's try. Lack of replication. Yep, that's it. And now I get all the rationales explaining why each choice is incorrect and why the correct answer is correct. And you'll notice students could still, if they wanted to, check out the hints for that. And so our hints, often the first hint is designed to help the students get just a general strategy for thinking about this certain concept. So here we're giving what are the what are the key factors of a well-designed experiment? It's random assignment, it's control, it's replication. Um, often the vocab can get pretty hairy, so we'll also use these um, little definition widgets to remind them of key definitions and the hints as well. Sometimes we use them in the items, but we don't usually do that in the AP courses because on the AP test, you're not going to get those, those definition reminders, but we'll often use them in the hints. And we'll also sometimes include extra examples in the hints as well. Um, less conceptual exercises. So this study design exercise is fairly conceptual and is multiple choice. 
We also have exercises that are um, numerical input. It's not multiple choice. It requires the student to do, um, I don't wanna call this free response practice because this is far from free response practice, right? They're not, they're not constructing a response, but there is, there's a definite, there's a higher level of challenge when a student has to just input the numerical answer rather than choose something that's close. Um, so on items like these, oh, I forgot to mention my cat, my, uh, he likes to walk in front of the camera when I start talking. So if you see a tail here, that's, that's him. Um, so you'll see on items like these, um, it's numerical input. Um, there's, a, there's this direction, you may round your answer to two decimal places. Um, this, this problem involves a normal calculation. So normal calculations, you can get competing answers depending on whether you use maybe a, say a, a Z table versus normal CDF. Um, and rest assured that we sort of uh, obsessively check and recheck answers to make sure like, okay, if they solve it with a table, will it still accept their answer? And if they solve it with normal CDF, will it still accept the answer? Um, we can add multiple correct answers. And we also add, this is one of the most frustrating things for students when they know they answered the question correctly and like the website wouldn't accept their answer. Right. So we make sure that there are multiple correct answers that will accept. And we're also kind and reasonable. So when it says you may round your answer to two decimal places, um, what we do is we add a margin of error. So we add a margin of error around the precise answer. So if they answer precisely, instead of rounding like we asked them to, um, they'll still be correct. Um, so pretty, pretty much any answer that is reasonable and you throw at it, it'll accept it as correct. And if a student says it, I was correct and it wouldn't mark me correct, chances are they're not correct. Um, I wanted to show you the hints for this sort of question as well. Is that calculator just a scientific calculator or does it have any special oh, six functionality? Good question. That calculator does not have special functionality. It's something that um, is in conversations but has not expanded beyond basic scientific yet. So on questions with more, um, on questions that are a little more involved, um, we, we really break it down step by step. Um, so, and this is again, like if I was a teacher, how I would try to how I would try to help the student out think about this problem. So here we're combining normal variables. So the first step is thinking about thinking about the distribution and what's its mean and standard deviation and how we can uh, how we can add the means to find the total mean and how we can add variances, not standard deviation to get the to get the standard deviation. And we use images to visualize the curves. Um, notice we don't provide the calculator, but we reference how to calculate the shaded area. Mm -hmm. And in our hints, we favor normal CDF over using the table. Um, and we're updating our exercises as well. You don't see it in this one, but I promise I'm going through and I'm adding links to where they can use free calculators online since most students have figured out in either in classroom or on their own where they can find normal curve calculators on the internet. But um, that's another support we often add in here is, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a free online calculator, you can find one at this link. Um, so we'll show students how to do it in the calculator. We'll explain why, why we use normal CDF instead of normal PDF if the student gets to that step and, is, and can't remember. Um, and we'll also, on, on items that, were, that we, we showed students how to do it with the calculator, but if a student really is stuck and says like, how do you do this without the calculator? We'll also show them how to do it with a more straightforward um, Z, uh, Z calculation. So I just showed you a lot about our built-in supports and exercises. Are there any questions on those? Uh, I do have a question. Um, and maybe you're gonna get to it later on, but from a sure. perspective in terms of analytics, um, is there something that as a teacher, you can kind of see where your students are at or where they're performing? Yeah, kinda. definitely. Um, yeah, I'll have, I'll have slides on that and okay. our time is pretty limited today. So I can't like get too deeply into that because there are, um, we could do sort of an entire like series of talks on how to do all of, all of those uh, different tools, but yeah, I'm going to show you some of those and where you can go to, uh, to learn more about those if you're interested. 
Cool. Well, I'll I'll keep on going so we can get to those and we don't run out of time. Um, let's go back to the talk here. So before we move down to the next section on um, sort of the, the mechanics of the site and the teacher tools, there's one more piece I wanted to show you in terms of how we design our practice for the students. Um, behind the scenes, we divide our items in an exercise in buckets we call types. And this isn't a computer doing it. It's like a human or me doing it because when a student goes into an exercise with four problems, we don't want them just to get any four problems. We like we don't want them to see the same kind of style of item four times in a row by random chance. We wanna make sure that when they go into that exercise, they see the variety they need to see. Um, so like, for example, when we're asking questions like the one on the screen, where we're trying to get a student to think about the shape of the sampling distribution of a mean, um, there are a lot of different there, there's almost like a flow chart you have to go through. It's like, well, what do I know about the parent population? Is it, do, do I know anything about it? Is the shape of the parent population unknown? Is the shape normal, known to be normal? Is it approximately normal? Is it skewed? Um, so what we do behind the scenes is, so this is, this is my view where I can organize the items. And what I do here is I, I, first, I, I write all the items and I plan this in advance, but I make sure in this one, for example, it's a student's going to do four items and I've sorted them into one, two, three buckets. And the page is refreshing sometimes because it does that. There we go. So you, the teacher, can be confident that students are going to see the things they're supposed to see in this exercise. Um, the student is going to see when they do this central limit theorem exercise, they're going to do one item where the shape of the parent population is unknown. Um, and the sample size from that population might be small and it might be large. So like here's an item where it's an unknown parent and it's a small sample. So the answer is we don't know the shape of the sampling distribution of the sampling mean. Um, there are other items in that type where it's an unknown parent, but it's a large sample. So you know that the sampling distribution will be approximately normal. And then there's another type where the population is known to be normal. And same thing, you get small, um, you get small samples in that one. And I only put small sample items in that one because those are the only interesting ones where the parent population is normal and the sample is small. Um, but then there are, oh, I'm sorry, not one, but two more types. There's one more type where it's a not normal population and it could be a small or large sample. And there's one more type where you're shown a graph of the parent distribution and you might get a large sample, you might get a small sample. Um, so that's a little detailed, but I, I show it for a reason because when, um, sorry, I'm sharing again. Because thinking back to when I was a teacher first starting to use like any online learning platform, I was always really skeptical. Like I said, we're gonna give you four questions. And I would think like, but when I pick the homework assignment, like I pick the questions very carefully and I don't want a computer giving my students the wrong set of questions that mm -hmm. isn't going to expose them to the thing they need to see. Um, so it, it does require, like at first when you're getting used to it, it requires a little bit of faith on your part. But then when you look at the reports that Bob was asking about, um, once you start to see the reports from like, here's the, here are the exact items your students were working on. Then you see like, oh, okay, the students are, are seeing that variety and it's each time they do an exercise. So in the example I just showed you, it's a, it's a do four exercise. So each time the students work on it, they get four items and they're divided into four types. So the students are going to get one from each type and it's in a, and it's in a random order as well. So, um, the students sort of don't, I'm trying to be nice here, but the students don't know what's going on really that they're seeing these four different items each time, but they're not exactly like all completely random. There's, there's a design to it. So that wraps it up for me talking about the content in the course. I wanted to move on to the mastery learning mechanics. Um, this sort of gets into how it works for you as a teacher using Khan Academy with your students. Um, but if you have any questions on what I just talked about, I'm happy to, to pause and take a break and hit any questions on our content. How often do you uptake content or are you updating content? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, it's, uh, I'll try not to give you too frustrating of an it depends answer. Um, All right. If, if um, 
I'm fairly active, not as active as I used to be on the teacher forums, um, but there, are, there have been times where I put my email address out there and I can tell you that I've gotten emails from people I've met on the AP statistics teacher community and they say, hey, there's something wrong. Here's the exercise and here's the hint. And I go, oh, you're, and sometimes it's just a typo. Other times it's, you know, your language was a little strong on that conclusion. You said like they should conclude that, but the wording should really be like they have enough evidence mm. to, to suggest that. And in those cases, when it's, when it's something that is wrong with our content, I will fix it immediately and, and click publish. So in terms of updating the content, like on an on-demand basis, if, the, if it's something that needs to be updated, mm. I will humbly fix it and click publish. Um, if it's, um, if it's a gap, like there's something we're not covering and we should be covering it. Um, we decide if it deserves like an immediate drop everything and make an exercise. Um, Sal is so incredibly fast. We can usually get a video out pretty quickly. If it's like, oh, this sort of thing, we really just need a video. Um, we can get that out pretty quickly. Um, so we, we try not to send Sal too many one-offs because like us, he works better when he's like focused on sort of like one or two courses at a time to make videos. But if it's quick one-off request, that's like, hey, we're missing a video on this or, hey, we, we have a video on this, but we need to clean up some of the language in it and probably it makes sense just to do a new one, then we can get one out within a week, uh, maybe less. Um, so in terms of dedicated projects, um, we try to touch each course and refresh it. Um, once every few years at most, but we'll wait for like sort of trigger events, let's say like there's a new CED that's been released, like, okay, we're gonna update the course. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's been this big edit to the CED, like something's been added or something's been removed, then we'll stop and we'll touch on the course. Was that too much or not enough? No, that's good, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, then I'll move on. The rest of this should be fairly quick compared to going through the content. Um, I wanted to start with that so you saw what we had to offer in terms of practice before jumping to the to the mastery mechanics. So I'll go into present again and show you how our mastery learning mechanics work. So our mastery system is a way that students and teachers can see what they have mastered and what they haven't. Um, and our mastery system is practice-based. So think of this as how students see what they know and what they don't know. Um, I took a screenshot of what my screen looked like in AP statistics. Um, this unit, I'm only 77% mastered. Um, I wrote the stuff, but I must say that I sometimes get questions wrong on purpose, which drops my percentage. And sometimes when I publish a new exercise, I don't get mastery on it as soon as I should. So this view shows me what I could work more on to get mastered. And you can see I've mastered this exercise because I have the little crown. Um, I've mastered all of these, but I have, uh, I've not reached mastery on this one over here. Um, and some key things to know about mastery is that it's practice-based. Um, it doesn't rely on watching videos or interacting with articles. The videos and articles are just designed to be supports to the students if they need them, but they're by no means a requirement to uh, to earn mastery. Um, and mastery isn't linear. Um, students can jump between units and their progress still counts. So if they're, um, yeah, they, they don't need to consume the course in the same sequence we presented it. So if a teacher is assigning a student exercises in a different order than, than we have laid out in our course, that's not going to affect their, their mastery score in any way. So the gist of how mastery works is that um, a student starts here at no mastery on a given exercise. Um, they can watch videos and they can practice if they're new to the material or they can jump right into the exercise itself or a quiz or a test. Um, you might see this logo. That means they've attempted the exercise. They at least went into it, but they got less than 70% of the items correct. Um, familiar is they got 70% or more correct when practicing an exercise. So if you're doing the math, like in a do four exercise, like most AP statistics exercises on Khan Academy are do four problems. So they'll get familiar if they get 70% or more correct. So they'll get familiar if they get three out of four. They'll get proficient if they get four out of four correct when practicing an exercise. Um, the only way to get to this mastered level on an exercise 
is to first get it to proficient, but then get it correct on a unit test. And I'll show you what those look like. Um, but the general idea is a student goes into an exercise, they get four questions, say they answer them all correct, that moves them up to proficient. If they got three out of four correct, it would move them up to familiar. And this may at first seem like, you know, I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would be into this, or, or maybe it's, oh, this does look pretty great. But either way, I think the key here is that this is a nice kind of quick way for students to see kind of where they are on a given skill, um, just with a quick visual, um, which is nice for review time if they're going back to do things. And then zooming out again at the course page, um, we haven't talked yet about quizzes and tests. Um, each of our exercises, you may have noticed from my screen sharing so far, each of our exercises are pretty specific. So you see there's this one that's on mean and standard deviation of the difference of sample means. And then there's this one that's on shape of the sampling distributions for differences in sample means. Um, so the exercises are pretty specific. And so the whole idea of our mastery system is that a student getting four out of four correct on this and four out of four correct on this doesn't mean they've mastered the thing because they've done it in isolated practice and they could forget it the next, the, the next second minute day for sure. Um, so we have quizzes and tests that give the students mixed practice. Um, and the quizzes, what they do is they pull questions from the exercises before them. So this quiz one, it says five questions and it would pull from the, let's see, one, two, three, four exercises before it. Um, quiz two would pull five questions, but it would only pull from these two exercises because it doesn't pull from the pre, it doesn't pull from items that have already been pulled from another quiz. So quiz three would be five questions from these three exercises and so on and so forth. So the quizzes are a nice way for students to get not isolated practice, but a little more of a mixed practice um, that would represent maybe like a day's worth or a few days worth of topics mixed together in, in a classroom. Um, a unit test pulls items from all the exercises in a given unit. Um, so this unit test here would pull um, everything in the sampling distribution unit would be, would be fair game. And the tests, what a lot of students and teachers like to do with those, um, a lot of them like to do it before, before a given unit to see what students know. It, sometimes students read ahead in the book or what have you. Um, sometimes teachers use them at the end of a unit for exam review um, or, or chapter test review, if you will. Um, you could do both. Um, I'm not sure if you remember when I was showing my screen how many items there were in an exercise, but there were, there were quite a lot. So the nice thing about our item banks is they're not infinite, um, but they are pretty deep. So when a student does an exercise a few, time, a few times and then goes to take a quiz or goes to take a test, they're not seeing repeated items. The system, can, the system tracks what each user has done already and makes sure that it doesn't show them a repeat item before it shows them a new item. So it is very hard for our students. It's, it's pretty challenging for students to exhaust the item bank um, but if they do, your teacher reports have very simple ways of showing you that information, um, which we will get to. This is just a screenshot of what students see after they take, say, a, a quiz or a test. Um, since a quiz or a test com contains multiple, um, multiple exercises, it'll show them how their skill level changed in each exercise. Um, sorry, I didn't get a screenshot from AP Stats for this. this. I stole this one from the science team, but this is showing how after the student took their unit test, they leveled up three exercises. You can see they leveled up this VSEPR exercise. They leveled up resonance and formal charge, and they leveled up Lewis diagrams, but they, let's see, they did not level down on anything and they had no change on five skills. So I, I showed you a lot there. Um, I th my intention was to email the slide deck out after, which I hope we can do, Lay and Bob. But um, there's a link in here that we have a, we have a really great course that um, just lays out everything about our, our mastery system and how to use it in your classroom if you want to. Um, so there's a link here to our Con for Educators resources if you're interested in learning more about that. And we're 
almost to time and I wanna have, have time for questions. So I'm gonna run ahead to teacher tools. I wanna keep the teacher tools short and sweet um, because we don't have much time together. And I wanna skip some steps like creating a course and adding students because like I just mentioned, we have this really great Con for Educators bank of resources that gives you videos or articles, whichever you like that just show you step-by-step step how to, uh, the, the very basics of creating a course and adding students. But just to, just to highlight some key features of it is my intention here. Um, but I'm happy to ask more to answer some questions if you have them. Um, but the general gist of it is that when you when you, if you decide like yeah I, I would be interested in using Khan Academy with my students, um, the, the first thing you do is create a course and you add your students. Um, and then after that, it's a matter of browsing our content, and you choose which content to assign. Um, when you assign our content, what if you you can choose to assign videos or not. Um, you could just assign the exercises, um, or you could just assign the videos, or you could assign all of the above. Um, but when you assign exercises, you have some control. You can choose: do you want your students to see different items, or do you want your students to see all the same items to make for better class discussion at the end? Um, so you have those options. Um, so the but the general gist of it is: you can assign them content, you can assign them all the content, you can assign them none of the content. Um, instead of assigning pieces of content, you can assign mastery. You can assign them to master the course. Um, so that, that's another option you have. Um, after you've assigned something and students do the work, um, you can see all their student scores and reports. Um, that will show you uh, um, what percent of the items students got correct, where each column is a different exercise you assigned. Um, that report, by the way, shows the highest score they've ever gotten, but you can, you can see other attempts as well. Um, also, if you click into a detailed assignment report, you can get after, I think, some of the information that Bob was looking for, where it shows you, um, it shows you this, it, it sorts it by the, the most challenging question, kind of in descending order. So the question that most of the students got wrong, um, follow, and then just in, yeah, that descending order of accuracy rate. Um, and then you can see the question itself. You can drill down into the responses to see which students responded with. Uh, so this one wasn't multiple choice. This picture here is a number input. Um, so you can see over here that um, in this demo class of five students, four got it wrong, one got it correct. And you can see that 13 stu uh, two students typed in the answer as 13 cubic units and two students thought it was 11 and one student thought it was 12. Um, and also you can, there are options there to reveal answer. Um, and there's a little drawing pad in case you wanna project this and you could draw off to the side to explain it. Or there's a tab for the hints where you can say like, let's see how they solved it. Um, you can also in this upper right-hand corner select if you wanna see all student responses versus just certain students. Um, so that was a very quick overview of just, we have more reports than this, um, but those are um, the highlights that most people ask about. So I want to make sure I read those out and showed you. Um, and again, if you want to see more about our teacher reports, um, feel free to email me or check out our Con for Educators course. But that does bring us to about time. So I want to thank you for your time. I know that especially for those of you on the East Coast, it is late at night. So I really appreciate you, really appreciate, appreciate being able to speak to you tonight about, um, about this work I've done and I hope it's useful to you. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions in our remaining time together, if you have any. Um, I believe there was a question in the chat from Beth. Um, would you assign these questions for practice or for assessments? And I know with assessments too, teachers are always like, you know, is there a way to download grades automatically, that type of thing? Because that's something that they, they want to be able to do. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would lean more towards practice. Um, okay. I know that there are teachers who say like, no, but I, I want to use it for assessment. And you could. Um, if I was using it for assessment, I think my biggest concern would be like, I, I want to see more from the students in terms of assessment when it comes to when it comes to written responses, because you've seen that we have multiple choice and we have number input. We also have some other like sorting items where they sort cards, like sort these distributions from smallest standard deviation to largest. But in terms of assessment, I really want to get at um, more written response, free response type practice. Um, so I, I, I suppose you could use this for assessment. Um, my recommendation there would be um, do if you want to do that to use the unit tests since the unit tests give that variety. Um, you'd have to be okay with students getting different sets of items from each other. Um, 
and like basically taking my word for it that the difficulty will be roughly the same. Um, but so you'd have to you'd have to kind of offload some trust to me. Um, but I I think I <laughs> I hope I've earned it. Um, but yeah, I would I would say unit tests for assessment you can make it work. Um, you may want to drill in to see um, something that Bob mentioned earlier was looking at like students response data, like the only, I'm trying to think of like, what's the worst case scenario for like, can a student cheat Khan Academy? And like, there, there are some very not clever ways that students have tried it that are just easy to see in your reports, where if the student has done the exercise five times and five times in a row in the span of an hour and has never gotten a question correct, um, then they got the unit test 100% correct. Yeah. Um, and they have to get the unit test correct. Like this is why I like mastery because even if you get the unit test correct once, you're not going to be mastered. You have to show repeated success. So you can see pretty clear in a student's record of like if they have like five wrong, wrong, like zero percent attempts on an exercise, and then all of a sudden they're acing unit tests. There's there's something going on there. Um, but I would I would for sure like 100 percent like hands down say it's great for practice. If I was still teaching, I would. I would offload all my homework to Khan Academy and have and use it and use Khan Academy for homework. I would supplement that homework with free response practice and sample AP questions as well. Um, but in terms of tests, not sure I'm there yet. So you kind of um, were, I was going to ask you that's what, what you would do, being that you are in both worlds, the Khan Academy and the AP stats world. If you were back in in the teaching mode you would just use the Khan Academy you think as the, uh, the homework with the- Yeah, and I would do a hybrid. Right. Yeah, it would be a hybrid homework model where right. it'd be mostly Khan Academy plus free response. And um, so let's say a teacher is gonna look at this right now, today, and <clears throat> we're two months before the AP exam. As what would you recommend that a teacher do? Let's say they're gonna load their kids in tomorrow. And for the rest of the sure. year, how could they best use Khan Academy for the rest of the school year, assuming that this is the first time they've opened it up? Yeah, great question. So if it's the first time they've ever opened it up, they make their class, they load their students in, um, what you could do is you could navigate to the unit that aligns to what you're currently, to what you're currently working on. And if given you're not like first day in that unit, if you've been in that unit for a little bit, um, I would recommend just have assigning to all your students using that assignment feature I showed. Um, assign them maybe the quiz that's closest to where you are in class. Like, oh, this quiz, the exercises that lead up to it, like that's just what we talked about in class. Maybe assign them that first quiz um, just to get them kind of like dip their toe in the water, um, see how they do. Um, or if you're closer to the end of the unit, maybe assign them the unit test and say like, Hey, you know, we have a chapter test coming up um, and for your review, um, your, your, your review assignment is to take this Khan Academy unit test. Um, and maybe the students write down the ones they got wrong to bring the class discussion, which you could also reference on your teacher report as well. Um, and you could also show the students um, some reminders of the, the various like hints uh, and video supports they have. Um, the nice thing about starting with the quizzes and unit tests, um, it's sort of, um, we don't design them specifically to be a pre-assessment, but you could use it that way if you wanted to. Um, so the example I just gave where it's test review, you could say like, okay, your first assignment on Khan Academy is to take this unit test and the unit test when you're done is going to show you like, hey, here are the exercises that you got, that you got questions wrong from. And here's the exercises you got questions correct from. And the student could then have uh, a little roadmap for going back and doing deeper review where they could look at which items they got wrong and really drill down and get extra practice in those specific exercises since those don't give them the mixed practice like the test does. Earlier, I, I think you mentioned something about, and maybe I'm wrong that you could, could you, maybe I'm wrong. Could you pick certain questions that the students had so the whole class could have the same questions? Is that what you had said? <laughs> So you don't get to pick the questions. When you make an assignment, you can, there's two options for an exercise. Um, students see different questions or mm -hmm. all students see the same set of questions. So you, the teacher, don't get to pick which questions appear in, in, in either okay. of those cases, but you do get to control whether each student sees the pseudo random mix or the same exact items as each other. So could I, if I had a class of 30 assign 
different groups. So let's say groups of five had the same questions so that they could work within a group and another group's working on similar but different questions. It's kind of a, like, really, you know, group work. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I got you. That's a really good question. I, I think the answer is if they're all in the same class, no. Oh, okay. But you can't subdivide you know, them up. Actually, no. You, let, hold on, let me try to do it live here. I think the answer right now is a hard maybe. Well, while, while you're thinking about that, I mean, I understand what, what uh, Bob is saying, because, you know, one of the things yeah. nice is when I put students in breakout rooms, I want them to have access to the same problems. So they're working on the same problems together. That just makes it a little bit easier if they're working together. So I could see where that would be helpful. Is that essentially what you were talking about? You can, yeah, okay, yeah, so you, you, can def, you can about. definitely do this. Um, let's see, do I have time to screen share? That's exactly what I was kind of I thinking about. Time, just... time to do a screen share, sure. Yeah. Can you see this? Yep. Cool. So yeah, this is what it looks like. Um, this is my test. This is my sort of a classroom I for just testing things out purposes. So it has a silly name and it only has one student in it. Um, but yeah, so here I am, I'm navigating the content using these drop downs. So here you can see our units again. So I can go to like study design. Um, this doesn't exist when you pick a quiz or a test since those are a random assortment. Um, mm -hmm. But when you just pick an exercise like this one, generalizability of results. I check it, I click assign. Um, I forgot about this drop down. So oh, I could yeah. pick same, same question set for all students, but um, this would list all your students in the course. I'm my own student, which is weird, but um, yeah. So here you could uncheck select all and you could select just the subset of students you wanted to get the same question and you could assign it. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That's that's good because exactly what I was thinking, Lee. Yeah, no, that's, but that's also helpful if students need help in a specific area. You know, because um, sometimes it's like, okay, there's these five students that didn't get this topic. It'd be nice just to assign them something and not have to assign it right. to everybody. So that's really helpful. Right. Yeah, and you can dig back deep into the into earlier units around review time or or any time really. Say like. Once, you, once you've identified a student when you're, I know there were times when I was grading a student's unit test and I thought like, oh, it's clear they don't know this topic from a few units ago. And you could write then assign it to say the handful of students as you were grading those tests who needed that help on the previous topic. That's good. All right. I, I don't know if there was any other questions in the chat. Um, I feel like you answered what was there. Um, there were, uh, two people that sent me their email addresses, I'll forward those on to you then, Jeff, uh, in an email, because uh, they were interested in getting the slides. You'd mentioned that. Um, Great, yeah, we'll do. Okay, all right. No, I really appreciate that, uh, this. Um, um, in retrospect, I always think maybe I should do this at the beginning of the year. I just got to make sure a note that I kind of put this in the plan when you start, because um, at the beginning of the year, particularly this year, just, just swamped and but um, um, I do think this is really good. I mean, Thanks. Yeah, and if you're if you're interested, I'm I'm in touch. I'm not going to say like who right now and put them out on YouTube, but like I know a few teachers from the teacher community who have like gone pretty deep with using Khan Academy in their courses and are like happy to help other teachers and just like kind of talk out like here's how I use it and here's like kind of like nitty gritty like here's. Here's when I roll it out in the year. Here's what I tell them. Here are the different like Google uh, like direction sheets I include for my course. Um, all that sort that of thing that they're, that they're happy to share with other people where if you, uh, if you want to email me directly, I could put you in touch with some of those people because um, yeah, be they're good. kind of happy to be that informal coach. And uh, can you remind us of your email address again? I'll throw that in the chat. Yeah, I'll type in the chat right now. You can type in the chat. I was gonna say you could shout it out, and I would type in the chat, but you can type in the chat probably faster than I can. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, there's also so many potential typos in my email address. My my last name is commonly misspelled, and so is Sal's K A H N. I sometimes slip still. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna send you an email. I'd like to just get some informal feedback from those other teachers that use it. Just you know the the spectrum of you know how it's used from minimally to you know this is all we do and everything in between. If you have a few of those, I think that would be really good. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you do you think that that students that use it find um, kind of the I don't know. It's not, I guess it's kind of like a badging system, you know, like the, your progress, yeah. like is that, is that, is that really motivating for them? Do you think, or? Um, all students, no. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a magic wand out there that works for, or a solution that works for every student. Um, but on the whole, um, I'm, I pretty confidently say yes. I was, I was just curious as if like teachers have commented that students find it motivating. I know I've used it before some of my, you know, some things in pre-algebra and stuff for the kids that are kind of the real tough learners. And those, uh, those badges are kind of really good motivators because, you know, I mean, they struggle and it's, it's just kind of, it validates that they're doing something, you know, without necessarily having to be a grade. I mean, if that makes any sense, because <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah. We, um, to kind of like learn best practices from other people on my team. When, when we first start working for Khan Academy and something we do throughout is we like take each other's courses and, and do all the practice content from the learner's perspective. And I know personally the, the little badges and the confetti for, for me, uh, a mid thirties something person, it, the, some of the magic has worn off. The confetti does not excite me the way it used to when I get a question correct and, and the badges since have lost some of their shine. Um, but one thing I do really like about the badging system is once you get used to it, it's, it's an informative roadmap of this, the content that you like, do I know that? Well, I have the mastery badge for it. So I think I know that it, um, versus ones where you, you don't have that mastery level at all. It's like completely gray or it only has that like initial level. Um, it's, it's a, usually a very accurate representation of my confidence in the material. So that's one thing I like about it. Just at a glance, I can see what I could work on more versus what I, what I already know. Has um, Khan Academy thought about, or maybe they have, um, having mini courses for educators, like how to teach AP statistics? Or in essence, oh, you know, um, they're kind of going through the same thing that a student would go through learning AP statistics. So we have our very first course that's kind of like that. So we're, we're not we're not at the level yet that you're describing, but the um, the course I linked in my slide deck, the Con for Educators course, is our kind of like first foray into that like teacher education space mm -hmm. where um, the collection of resources like isn't just a collection of articles and videos. Like there there are Khan Academy exercises. There's like practice on how to set up your course. So you're, you're kind of like, you're doing the learner journey to learn how the mastery system works mm -hmm. um, to learn how to use Khan Academy in your classroom. So I highly recommend that course. I helped only a little bit um, with its creation, um, but I've taken the course and it's, I, I learned new stuff taking it. I was like, in fact, it helped me give this talk today. <laughs> Cause there were some things I, I was like, how does, does that number on the report, is that their most recent attempt or their highest attempt? It's like, oh no, I learned that in the, in the Khan Academy course. Okay. Right. Anybody else have any questions they would like to ask? I think, I think we kind of got covered. Yeah. So I, I know all the people that uh, were here tonight uh, felt like this was a very, very helpful session. Yes. Um, and I know I learned some information too. Um, so I, I need to think about using this as a supplement for some of my students that might be struggling, um, you know, to, to give them some additional resources in my college level statistics class. I think it might be helpful for some of those students. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Um, and this is gonna get posted on YouTube, uh, as I said, in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, and uh, I think we have one other presenter uh, in about a month, right? Uh, yeah, and hey, Jeff, are you on Facebook? I'm not. Okay, because I was, you know, I could link you on the, the um, 
Facebook, you know, kind of uh, shout outs, but so you'll get a public shout out. You just won't read it. <laughs> I appreciate the shout out, even though I won't read it. I will uh, post the link to the AP statistics teacher community with the college board. Um, so the link will be there. Um, yeah. And then the, just so you know, for anybody that's watching this in video form uh, in about a month. Uh, so actually exactly a month from now, because uh, that's how March works after February with 28 days. In yeah. February. Yeah. Uh, so about uh, exactly a month from now, we're going to be having Laura Wing Ringwood present on standard-based grading um, and specifically in AP statistics. So um, that'll be interesting to listen to if you're interested in learning about how that can be done um, in statistics. So thanks everyone for being here tonight. That's exciting. I'm going to meet you again in about a month. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Jeff, for getting an email from me. So um, about connecting with those teachers. So thank you very much. And, uh, you know, appreciate everything that you do. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks again for the invite. It was really, really great to be here. All right. Thank you.